I am gonna tell you why this is the poor man's Ferrari. If, if you've ever thought about owning a Ferrari but really didn't wanna tie up all that money and all the high-end maintenance and then storing a car that's well over $100,000 for you to use every now and then, this is the brand you wanna look for. 32 valve V8 that is an absolute monster. It sounds like an F1 car going down the road. I have had so much fun driving this vehicle. I'm so happy that I purchased it. And I'm gonna show you why, if you ever wanted a Ferrari but couldn't afford one, this is the vehicle for you. My name is Craig from Flying Wheels, and I have had the pleasure of driving this 2003 Maserati GT Cambio Corsa for the last week. And I'm gonna tell you all about this. First of all, let me start by saying welcome to my Flying Wheels YouTube channel. If you guys love anything auto-related, then make sure to hit the subscribe box down in the corner right around here or right around here somewhere to catch up on all of our latest videos. And you can hit a little bell down below to get notifications every time we make a new video. Now this vehicle right here is a two plus two four seater V8 rear wheel drive, unbelievable machine. I have had so much fun driving this car for the past week. I can't describe completely what a good time it's been. So here's a clip right here of what it's been like for me. I bought today a 2003 Maserati GT Coupe Cambio Corsa. Cambio Corsa. Probably shouldn't have bought it, but I just couldn't resist it. Here's going to be my favorite part. Ready? Now, this car did come in an optional Spider convertible, but what I'm testing this week is the 2 plus 2 Coupe Cambio Corsa. The Cambio Corsa GT version is a six-speed paddle-shifted automatic transmission versus the six-speed manual transmission option, which is a lower price point. Base price on the GT six-speed manual transmission was 84621 Tested as it shows with the Cambio Corsa package, which was the paddle-shifted six-speed automatic transmission, was 87821 it was a little bit extra with the tri-coat yellow pearl paint as well. So now the other thing to take into consideration when purchasing these cars, it's an Italian sports car, which means fragile. It's a fragile. Fragile. It's fragile. It's main maintenance required. It is a maintenance hog is what everybody thinks of when they think of Ferrari or Italian sports cars. Who the heck is going to maintain this car? Well, this was meant to be a more of a daily driver like the 911 was, like the XKR was, more so than the Ferrari. So it's a little less maintenance required, maintenance conducive. Uh, Ferrari 40, 40, a Ferrari with 46,000 miles is considered high mileage. A Maserati with 46,000 miles, which is meant to be driven every single day, is actually really low mileage. Now, I did my research when I bought this car I pulled the car facts it showed me that it came from Texas originally went to Colorado for almost all of its life which has no salt which is a great thing which also has winters which means it's not gonna be driven in the winter hopefully and then it came up to New Hampshire just recently where I purchased it now before purchasing this car specifically I did my due diligence I found through the car facts that it was worked on and maintained at Ferrari of Denver the other thing is obviously I checked the car facts and found the history and got to know the car a little bit better and then even found the person that maintained it out here in the Northeast and called them about it and asked them about it too. So buying these cars, I've seen them as low as $8,000. Do you necessarily want a Maserati for $8,000? Probably not and there's probably a reason that it's $8,000. Even upwards of $11,000, that trim and wear really started to show on those cars. So this one, knowing the car, knowing that it's the higher end of the spectrum for the GT Cambio Corsa. I really saw a lot more value in this car and then knowing that it had the clean Carfax, knowing that it was serviced and maintained from Ferrari of Houston and Ferrari of Denver, says a lot about the previous owners too. It wasn't just taking a jiffy lube for oil changes. So all those things made me feel a lot more comfortable in the purchase of this car, which makes me enjoy it a lot more. Now a week in of actually having this vehicle, I've, I'm still enjoying it and I actually feel more comfortable with it. The first few days I was really getting to know it and learning how it works and I really had no idea there were so many quirks to it that I couldn't figure out. Now I'm a week in and I'm absolutely loving it, still loving it, so much that I took my wife on a date night with it. She was not impressed though, if you guys saw that video last week. No, 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 no. 4.2 liter V8 Maserati engine designed hand in hand with Ferrari. This is considered the F136 engine. It's a 90 degree 4.2 liter V8 
all aluminum block, aluminum heads, dual overhead cam, 32 valve, two valve per cylinder VVTI engine with 390 horse, 333 foot pounds of torque. They're still using this engine design today. It began in 2001 and currently being in use in 2022's designs in Ferraris and Maserati. The successor is the F-154 twin turbo, which you'll see in the Ferrari California T. What was common in the early 2000s and happening quite frequently was a lot of these flagship, really high-end auto manufacturers were resurrecting companies that had fallen off or kind of died out in their past that were actually producing quality premium vehicles. Ferrari was doing it with the Maserati, Mercedes did it with Maybach, and it even happened with Bugatti too. So the Bugattis you know now were starting to come back to life. Now Maserati hadn't actually died. Maserati was owned by the Fiat Corporation in Italy, and Maserati had a few vehicles. They had a bi-turbo that was not wildly popular. They actually replicated kind of like a Chrysler LeBaron convertible look. I think they actually used a lot of Chrysler LeBaron convertible uh, parts and kind of made it their own into a Maserati that was known to actually catch on fire. Now this vehicle, the GT, was basically that bring back to life vehicle for Ferrari. So what happened is Ferrari purchased half, 50% of Fiat in 1997 and started designing something similar to this. And in 1999, Ferrari purchased the Maserati brand 100% and went full in to this vehicle, designing what would be their comeback car to what is Maserati today. Now I bought this car for my dealership and when I saw it, I actually heard it before I saw it. So I heard it coming off the highway and as a car guy, I had to look. And I saw a yellow car coming off the on-ramp to what I thought was a Ferrari. And as I pulled in closer, it still looked like a Ferrari and then when I really started to get to see it, I knew what the car was. Now Ferrari specifically didn't want this vehicle to be confused with the Ferrari brands. So it is kind of like a tiny sister to what the Ferrari 360 Modena was, although a lot of things are very, very different. That was essentially the older sibling to this vehicle. Now that was a mid-engine Ferrari V8, so I really can't compare a lot of it to this vehicle. But when you look at the styling, it looks like a shorter uh, front engine version of that vehicle on a budget. And that's exactly what this car is. Now if you look at the size, it's about the size of a Nissan 350Z. It's not a compact, tiny coupe. It is actually 12 inches longer than the Jaguar XKR and the Porsche 911, which is the direct competition of this vehicle. So back in 2003, when Ferrari and Maserati were designing this vehicle, their direct competition was the Porsche 911 and the Jaguar XKR. They wanted people that were buying these vehicles to stop buying those vehicles and buy this car. So the benefit of this vehicle over the Porsche 911 and the Jaguar XKR is it's actually 12 inches longer. So even though the 911 and XKR does have a back seat, it's almost useless because there's zero leg room and the seats actually touch the front seat. But what you'll see here in these bucket seats and two plus two rear, is that there is a little bit of legroom. So I can fit my kids in this car, which is part of the appeal to purchasing this vehicle. I can drive it with my wife and fit two children in the back comfortably. And if you really needed to fit two adults, they could because there is more headroom in this car than there is in the XKR and the 911. Now you'll notice the headlights are a very similar Ferrari design, but they're a lot smaller than anything you would have seen on like the Modena. They did not want to have Maserati confused with Ferrari, so they made a lot of little subtle changes to make the vehicle known as a Maserati and only slight confusions with a Ferrari. So it was enough to have similarities between the two brands, but not enough to be confused with each other. Now going back to 2003, I'm actually really impressed with the wheels. These are 18 inch wheels with a set of Pirelli P0 tires and a giant braking system. 18 inch wheels aren't something that was common in 2003. I mean the Escalades, the rappers would put 20s and call them dubs and that was a huge deal. But, but typically vehicles were laced with 17 inch wheels around this time. So to have a set of 18s on a factory car in 2003 wasn't something you'd see all the time. Now typically anything Ferrari and even Cadillac in their sports cars were designed by Pininfarina. This car was not. It was actually designed by, I'm going to say this completely wrong, 
Gia Gajaro. Giu Giaro. I don't know, you tell me how to say it, I'm really not sure. Part of the car that was confusing to me was it almost looks like two different cars from front to back. So you have a nice long nose in the front and it's really sharp and streamlined and then it turns into a completely different vehicle from the windshield back. So the flow almost starts right here. This looks like one car going through and I compare it to the new Supra a lot because it's very similar minus the flare off the trunk. This to me looks like one car. This to me looks like a completely different car. So if I show you here, there's a flow there and there's a flow there. But to me, it still looks like there's no complete perfect flow of aerodynamics on that vehicle. If you disagree, let me know. Now something a lot of people have brought to my attention are these taillights, which I actually like these taillights a lot. What do you guys think they look like? I would love to hear you looking at these, what they look like to you. What do they remind you of? I'm going to tell you, comment down below what you guys think these look like on the rear end. I'm going to tell you what everyone keeps saying to me in three, two, one. I keep being told that this looks like a Honda Prelude from the rear. Do you agree? Okay, before I get to the interior, which I actually really like, I have to show you how this sounds because it's my absolute favorite part of the car. Driving it down the road, I feel like I'm driving an F1 car because it handles amazingly well, but it sounds incredible. Now, this isn't the original exhaust. It does have all four original catalytic converters. Now, that is absolutely my favorite part of the car. I don't even need the radio because I love listening to the sound of the exhaust so much. The car has a dry weight of only 3,600 pounds. So in a V8 car, a Mustang is similar in weight. I know the new Jaguar XKR convertibles are about the same exact weight as well. So it's not a heavy car with close to 400 horsepower. The interior was a complete redesign for 2003. Ferrari and Maserati joined together to help design this car. When I purchased it, it had a set of yellow, it had a set of black floor mats with yellow trim, which almost made it to be too much yellow. So if you look in here, you'll see the yellow lacing around the dash, yellow stitching on the seats are really, really subtle. I mean, I didn't even really notice it until I looked closely. And then obviously yellow stitching and lacing on the door panel as well. It came with two sets of floor mats stacked on top of each other. So you'll see the black original floor mats that are in perfect condition because it also came with a set of floor mats like this with yellow stitching around the outside of the floor mats. With these in the car, it actually made everything too much yellow. So as soon as I took them out, it turned in to a lot less and this is that less is more style that I really like about it. Now while we're back here I might as well go to the trunk. The great part about this is it has a trunk so to compare it to the 911 the 911 has that front boot with a, a little bit of space minimal space. This you can set a fit a set of uh, golf clubs in here you can fit your luggage in here it's actually pretty spacious for a 2 plus 2 coupe and you have storage in here as well with your battery. Storage off to the side and then in here, storage as well where the spare would go. We have the Coupe Cambio Corsa embossed logo into the glove box. Cambio Corsa meaning six speed automatic with paddle shifters in this vehicle. Now literally translated, Cambio is exchange and Corsa is race. So exchange race is what Cambio Corsa would be translated into. So first thing stepping into this car, sitting into this car that I noticed is how the heck do you shift the car? I actually had to ask the previous owner how to drive this thing. I mean, to start it is easy. We put the key in, we turn it, we put the foot on the brake, it starts up. It starts in neutral. So I'm really not sure how to put it in gear aside from this little toggle switch that only has an R on so it. So once the key is in, it starts automatically in neutral. Now if we hold this toggle switch right here, this will put us in reverse, and you can see reverse. But how do you get it out of reverse, how do you get it into park, and how do you get it into gear? Well, with the emergency brake down, foot on the brake, if we tap up, on the paddle shifter, we are now in first gear, so we can actually get going. Now to put it in neutral, I can't do it with holding the camera. I'll actually hold down and up with both hands and it will go into neutral and then 
to pull the emergency brake. What is funny about this car is there's no parking gear. You can actually argue that and say, well, even a manual transmission has a parking gear by putting it in first or reverse. Well, this car has no parking gear. So the way the owner's manual says to do it is to keep it in first gear, pull the emergency brake up, and shut the vehicle off. But when you turn the car back on, it automatically turns into neutral. To get it into reverse, it's just a simple hold. You hold this button, it goes right into reverse. And then once again, if we push it up, we're into first gear. Now driving it, we had the six-speed manual transmission and the optional Cambio Corsa package, which was the paddle shifting six-speed automatic. Now this is a true paddle shifting vehicle. So if you think about Audi's Tiptronic was popular back at this time, Tiptronic was you just tap it over and you tap it up into gear and it shifts like an automatic car, but at the rev limiter that you wanted to shift at or the shift point that you wanted to shift at. Well, this vehicle is just like driving a manual transmission. So if I want it to shift, I hit up. If I want it to shift down, I hit down. And it actually engages a clutch that feels like you're shifting a manual transmission. So you have that lag that almost jerks your head forward a little bit to shift it up and down, which is a little funny to get used to. I actually thought there was something wrong, but it's pretty normal in this vehicle. The other thing that I like, the option, is auto. So you'll see auto right here. Auto is a true automatic transmission. So if I put auto, you'll see on the dash, it says auto right there. It is just like driving an automatic transmission. It will shift for me whenever I want it to. And even when I shut the vehicle off and turn the car on again, like I just did, I left it in auto when I shut the car off, and now it's in auto when I turn the car back on. So all I'd have to do is hit auto, turn it off, you'll see the light went off, and I can drive it like a manual transmission car with paddle shifters. Now, while we're over onto this area, I'll discuss the quality of the interior. Now, the steering wheel is actually real carbon fiber steering, leather wrapped on the edges, and even to go into detail on the paddle shifters are leather wrapped as well. And over the years, so this car is 2019, 16 years, even the, the, even the writing on the paddle shifters hasn't worn off yet. I would say the fit and finish of this vehicle is actually pretty nice. Going to the center console, it does have navigation which is dated for 2003, and much like Audi, a lot of the buttons are rubber buttons. So you'll start to see a lot of it kind of wore off, like I even touched up some of these spots just because they did wear off, and these ones I'm not even sure what they do. I think this is a defroster, but I'm really not sure. And then here and here, are your automatic windows. So if you push it, going up is manual. But if you push it down, it'll go down automatically. Now one thing I noticed about the windows, they don't go all the way down. This is where they go on both doors, which is a little strange. It even has carbon fiber trim on the door panels as well. It also has traction control here, which I haven't quite figured it out. I mean, if I was in a Corvette or a Mustang or a Camaro, I hit the traction control, the wheels spin, and the car just goes. This one still just handles like it should be on a racetrack, which I'm not complaining about because that's amazing. But it does, it, you can't do a burnout like you could in a Camaro, a Corvette, or a Mustang. Not that you'd even want to in this car anyway. It's not really built for that. Another thing I like to mention is the heated and memory seats. So it does have power seats, heated seats, and memory seats on both passenger and driver's seat and the heated seats still work after all these years going to the radio it has an auditorium 200 stereo which is marginal it's not an unbelievable radio but it doesn't sound awful either going to the leather the leather quality is actually really great the grain of leather is is pretty well done and maserati logos embossed in both seats passenger and driver the only one real complaint I have about it is this piece right here. So this is a CD changer, and when you open it, it's actually easy to unplug the CD changer and plug an auxiliary cord in. So I can plug this into my phone and listen to my music through the radio from my phone. But you'll see this trim piece is cracked in a few places, like I have this piece that goes right here. This is really brittle, so it's showing its age over time and has really kind of worn out. That's probably the only part of this car that's really showing its age and I feel like it's kind of cheap right there. Final review of this vehicle, I've seen them before. I have never been a fan of this car ever. I thought it was funny looking, 
I didn't really think it was powerful because I didn't know the power plant in this vehicle. But now that I have one, now that I've driven it, I absolutely love it. It is a different car than a Camaro and a Mustang and a Corvette. I can't even put them in the same category. I enjoy it in a different way. You get looks from people in a different way as if you're driving a Ferrari because it is an Italian sports car. And even I've been in a 911 and an XKR, and XKR never really impressed me. It felt like I am just always going to be fixing it. It felt cheap. It felt broken to me. The 911, I would still put in a top tier. The 911 has a, a look that is almost timeless. Not almost, it is timeless. I mean, you can go back to the 70s and the 911 is still an amazing looking classic car. So I would put the 911 up at top, but this Cambio Corsa is a different ride than the 911 because the 911 is a mid-engine car. It handled differently. This thing I felt like it was meant to be driven differently than the 911 was. And, and it is a different car, even though they put it in the same category. And the price tag is significantly lower. If I think of an 03, 911, forget about if it's a twin turbo. If I put an 03 911 with 46,000 miles up for sale, I'd be well into my high 20s. And this car, an 03 Cambio Corsa GT with 46,000 miles, is going to be under 20 grand, which is really a bargain to consider a Ferrari engine under $20,000. So this is my 2003 Maserati GT Cambio Corsa, and it's for sale now. So if anyone's interested, it's going to be at the low, low price of around $18,000. Also, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting my channel. Always thanks for the comments because when you guys comment, it hits an algorithm and recommends the videos to more people so more people get to watch it, which is helping support my channel. So tell me if you hate the car. Tell me if you love the car. Tell me if you hate the videos. Tell me if you love the videos. Last thing, make sure to subscribe down below. Actually, second to last thing, my merch store is open. You guys have asked for my merch. I have a merch store. The link is in the description. You can go buy my hats and my shirts and my hoodies. You can even buy those little things that go on the back of your phone with my logo on it. When you buy those things, it helps support my channel because I don't really get paid much from YouTube. So when you buy my, my swag, my merch, it helps support my channel and helps me put out better content for you guys. So thanks again for the support. I'll see you all later. Adios.